right, welcome back, family Bible time. Uh, I should say, welcome back, family Bible time. This thing wasn't plugged in. We're in Ezekiel again. Ezekiel chapter 5 to 8, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Um, you know where we started yesterday, don't you, with that wonderful vision of God, and then Ezekiel's call, and the call to be a, a prophet to a people who don't want to hear, who will refuse to hear, but to be called to be that prophet anyway was um, quite quite the task for Ezekiel, wasn't it? Really um, quite an amazing calling, and I, I, uh, I can't help feeling sorry for him, but like Jeremiah, to have to minister to people who just don't, who will refuse to hear what you're saying. Well, we're going to see some of that today, and um, Ezekiel, yesterday we learned was the, um, the, 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 the living illustration, wasn't he? So God was not only calling him to prophesy judgment uh, to the people and to have them refuse to, to listen despite that, but to warn them anyway. Um, but, but he was going to do those prophecies in, a, in a, such a strange way. I think his contemporaries would have called him the nutty prophet. <laughs> Just because the stuff he had to do, the stuff God had him do, was just bizarre. I mean, some of it was so strange for, for us, and you'll hear some of that today, that um, you, can't really, you can't really picture being told to do that. And maybe you, you, if someone today were to do this kind of thing, we'd say they have gone crazy. But Ezekiel actually did hear from God. God did tell him to do this stuff. It wasn't because he was crazy, but it was the fact that God was um, literally driven um, to, to his fierce anger and driven to extremes to try to warn the people. So now um, they were going to get some pretty stark pictures from someone who was actually deadly serious. Let's pray and we'll get into Ezekiel chapter 5. Father in heaven, we pray that you would please be with us and strengthen us and teach us and help us to understand these strange um, prophetic illustrations that Ezekiel had to give and Lord, help us not to take them out of context. We pray that you would teach us uh, to interpret them rightly in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, chapter 5, Ezekiel, and you, O son of man, take a sharp sword, use, a, use it as a barber's razor, and pass it over your head and your beard. Ooh, then take balances for weighing and divide the hair. This is one of those situations where I just cannot relate to Ezekiel's um, situation. Because if I divided up my hair, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be anything to weigh, would there? Ezekiel must have had a lot of hair and a big beard. A third part you shall burn in the fire in the midst of the city. So there he is, bald. And with a big pile of hair, thank you. And with a big pile of hair. And he's taking a third of it. And then he's burning it in the middle of the city, and people are going to be saying, "What are you, you, you ever, have you ever smelt burnt hair? It is one of the most foul smells. Burnt hair and burnt fingernails, things like that, just really stink. Um, anyway, so the, the people would have been gathering, what are you burning your hair for? And... He had a message for them, didn't he? A third part, you should burn in the fire in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are completed. And a third part, you shall take and strike with the sword all around the city. So there he is, walking around the city with a sword, whacking his hair with it. 
and a third part you shall scatter to the wind, and I will unsheath the sword after them, and you shall take from these a small number and bind them in the skirts of your robe, and of these again you shall take some and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire, and there, from there a fire will come out into all the house of Israel. Now, you've got to believe that there were people following Ezekiel around and just kind of staring at what he's doing, because otherwise none of this particularly has any meaning. But if, if people are watching him and if people are reporting what he's doing, and that's becoming the gossip in the town in Jerusalem during the siege, remember, then this is a very powerful message, isn't it? God's going to take his people and some of them are going to die and some of them are going to be driven around and some of them are going to be preserved, but then some of those are going to die. It's powerful pictures. Verse 5, Thus says the Lord, This is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of the nations with countries all around her and she has rebelled against my rules doing wickedness more than the nations and against my statutes more than the countries all around her, for they have rejected my rules and have not walked in my statutes. Therefore thus says the Lord God, because you are more turbulent than the nations that are all around you and have not walked in my statutes or obeyed my rules and have not even acted according to the rules of the nations that are all around you, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against you, and I will execute judgments in your midst, in the sight of the nations. And because of all your abominations, I will do with you whatever I have, what I have never yet done, and the like of which I will never do again. Therefore fathers shall eat their sons in your midst, and sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments on you, and any of you who survive I will scatter to the winds, to all the winds. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things with which, and with all your abominations, therefore I will withdraw. My eye will not spare, and I will have no pity. A third part of you shall die of pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. A third part shall fall by the sword all around you. And a third part I will scatter to all the winds and I will unsheathe the sword after them. Now a little note um, on the side. A third, a third, a third. Does this make you think of anything? Actually, for me, it makes me think of Revelation. Do you remember the seal judgments in the book of Revelation and then the bowls and the trumpets? Do you remember those? Are you reading about those? Are you reading Revelation at the moment? Okay, so you, as you read about those judgments, some of them, like a third of the, a third of the earth is consumed. Now, just when you get to the book of Revelation, people tend to take, all it, take it all pictorially and say it doesn't mean anything. Well, I'm just going to point out the reality that this judgment actually did fall upon the people of God. And th th there was a literal fulfillment of these prophecies as... As pictorial as it were, I don't know how literally the the numbers divided into thirds, whether it was approximate thirds or whether God somehow worked it out exactly so that it was a third. But that doesn't matter to me. The the point is, it's a it's a prophecy that was full that had meaning and was fulfilled literally, and we should not interpret Revelation in any other way. Ah, then thus my anger shall thus shall my anger spend itself, and I will vent my fury upon them and satisfy myself. 
and they shall know that I am the Lord, that I have spoken in my jealousy when I spend my fury upon them. Moreover, I will make you a desolation and an object of reproach among the nations all around you and in the sight of all who pass by. You shall be a reproach and a taunt, a warning and a horror to the nations all around you when I execute judgments on you in anger and fury and with furious rebukes. I am the Lord. I have spoken. When I send against you the deadly arrows of famine, arrows for destruction for which I shall send to destroy you, and when I bring more and more famine upon you and break your supply of bread, I will send famine and wild beast against you, and they will rob you of your children. Pestilence and blood shall pass through you, and I will bring the sword upon you. I am the Lord. I have spoken. Okay, this is serious stuff, isn't it? Um, and God is not saying, um, maybe now he's saying it's happening, isn't he? God is saying, this, is, this judgment is coming. And um, is, Ezekiel was very graciously given this warning. Excuse me. We've been... Oh, we've been exercising these backs of ours, haven't we? <laughs> Let me try and prop myself up here. Um, Ezekiel was graciously given, giving, um, giving warning and warning of judgment. And this is exactly the kind of warning of judgment that people mock, isn't it? You, you've seen it on Tintin, haven't you? On the cartoons, there's the picture of the the prophet in the street saying, whoa, judgment, judgment, the end of the world. And, and everyone's laughing at him. And now here's um, Ezekiel, but he's actually prophesying. I mean, I guess when it is actually the end of the world, those prophets of doom are right, aren't they? But, the, but Ezekiel was a prophet of doom, and he was actually a man of God. So what makes the difference between someone who's a genuine prophet, who's warning people, and someone who's just a, a doomsday prophet, who just likes to kind of scare people? There is something, isn't there? Something in the human makeup which means that some people actually like scaring people. And that's no good, is it? So a true spokesman for God is going to warn people faithfully, but probably um, has to be thoroughly sincere in everything, not just um, doing it for some kind of selfish motive, whether it's because it makes them feel good or just um, that they, they like the attention that it gives them or something like that. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? But a true prophet like Ezekiel was someone who was warning people faithfully on behalf of God. Chapter 6. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them and say... You mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. And I think it's probably speaking about Israel's idolatry by, um, you know, the, this term mountains, because that's where they did a lot of their idolatry. You mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills, to the ravines and the valleys. Behold, I, even I, shall will bring a sword upon you. And I will destroy your high places, your altars shall become desolate, and your incense altars shall be broken. And I will cast down all your slain before your idols, and I will lay the dead bodies of the people of Israel before their idols, and I will scatter your bones around your altars. Wherever you dwell, the cities shall be waste, and the high places ruined, so that your altars will be waste and ruined, and your idols broken and destroyed, your incense altars cut down and your works wiped out. 
The slain shall fall in your midst, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Yet I will leave some of you alive when you have when you have among the nations some who escape the sword, and when you are scattered through the countries, then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where they're carried captive, how I have been broken over their whoring heart that has departed from me, and over their eyes that go whoring after their idols. And they will be loathsome in their own sight for the evils they have committed, for all their abominations. And you shall know, then, and they shall know that I am the Lord. I have not said in vain that I, will do, I would do this evil to them. Now, I've got to point this out. This is a God who says he has been broken by all their idolatry. They're whoring, the whoring heart, whoring after their idols. This is the idolatry of the heart. Setting your heart on something other than the true God. You've been created by God, right? So here we all are, God's children, you could say in that sense. God deserves our worship. Just like a husband or a wife deserves the faithfulness of their husband or wife, so God deserves the faithful worship of his children, doesn't he? He made you. He deserves your worship. You go and give that worship. You set your heart on anything other than the true God you're you're committing adultery against God, effectively. This is, but how does God feel about that? This is, this is really insightful, isn't it? I have been broken over their whoring heart. This is God bearing His heart to people. Now, some people struggle with that. By the way, if you're theologically minded, you might say, "Oh, but how does that fit with the impassibility of God?" And I would just say, it doesn't. If you're going to believe in the impassibility of God, in, in the classical sense that God cannot have emotions because God cannot change in any way, that's the sort of philosophical way in which people argue for, towards the idea that God doesn't experience emotions, then you would end up saying that these emotions that are put before us are mere anthropomorphisms in order to um, kind of help us to understand how God feels. You know what, I'm just going to leave it with the text and say God was broken over it. I'd rather just leave the tension there in my own mind. I don't understand how God can have emotions and yet not change, but I don't really have to reconcile those things clearly in my mind, um, perfectly, in order to be able to understand this text. If I just lost you, don't worry, read a theology textbook and <laughs> about the impassibility of God and it'll all make sense to you. At least what I've just said will make sense, even if the whole thing doesn't make sense. Um, anyway, we should move on. Did I lose you? Okay, 11, verse 11. Thus says the Lord, clap your hands and stamp your foot and say... You all right? What's up? Oh, don't, don't, don't you do it. This is God saying it to Ezekiel. Um, clap your hands and stamp your foot and say, Alas, because of all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. He who is far off shall die of pestilence, and he who is near shall fall by the sword. And he who is left and is preserved shall die of famine. Thus I will spend my fury upon them, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When their slain lie among their idols, around their altars, on every high hill and on all the mountain tops, under every green tree and under every leafy oak, wherever they offered pleasing aroma to all their idols, and I will stretch out my hand against them and Make the land desolate and waste in all their dwelling places from the wilderness of Riblah. Then they will know that I am the Lord. 
Now, if you're circling things in your Bibles, um, you'll see that this is a repeated phrase, isn't it? That's how we do Bible study. Then they will know that I am the Lord. What is God saying by all this judgment? He's teaching his people, Israel, that he is truly Yahweh. He's truly God. And he hasn't forgotten them. He hasn't abandoned them. He's disciplining them now. He's judging them. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? When God disciplines his children, they know that he is the Lord. But they also know that they're his children. That's what it says. If anyone is without discipline, um, he doesn't belong to him. So for us as Christians, when we, when we experience God's discipline, we can at least take heart that he's teaching us that he's the Lord. All right, verse 7, chapter 7, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. And you, O son of man, thus says the Lord that it, to the Lord God to the land of Israel, An end, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end is upon you, and I will send my anger upon you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will punish you for all your abominations. And my eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity, but I will punish you for for your ways while your abominations are in your midst then you will know that I am the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, disaster after disaster, behold it comes, an end has come, the end has come, it is awakened against you, behold it comes, your doom has come to you, O inhabitant of the land, the time has come, the day is near, a day of tumult, and not of joyful shouting on the mountains. Now I will soon pour out my wrath upon you, and spend my anger against you, and judge you according to your ways, and I will punish you for all your abominations, and my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will punish you according to your ways, while your abominations are in your midst. Then you will know, here it is, here circle it, then you will know that I am the Lord who strikes. Behold the day, behold it comes, your doom has come, the rod has blossomed, pride has budded, violence has grown up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor their abundance, nor their wealth, neither, neither shall there be preeminence among them. The time has come, the day has arrived. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is upon all their multitude. For the seller shall not return to what has been sold while they live. For the vision concerns all their multitude. It shall not turn back, and because of his iniquity, none can maintain his life. They have blown the trumpet and made everything ready, but none goes to battle, for my wrath is upon all their multitude. The sword is without, pestilence and famine are within. He who is in the field dies by the sword, and him who is in the city, famine and pestilence devour. And if any any survivors escape, they will... They will be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them moaning, each one over his iniquity. All hands are feeble, all knees turn to water. They put on sackcloth, horror covers them. Shame is on their faces and boldness on all their heads. They cast their silver into the streets and their gold is like an unclean thing. Their silver and gold are not able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They cannot satisfy their hunger or fill their stomachs with it, for it was the stumbling block of their iniquity. His beautiful ornament they used for, they used for pride, and they made their abominable images and their detestable things of it. 
Therefore I make it an unclean thing to them, and I will give it into the hand of foreigners for prey, and to the wicked of the earth for spoil, and they shall profane it. I will turn my face from them, and they shall profane my treasured place. Robbers shall enter and profane it. Forge a train, sorry, forge a chain, for the land is full of, don't laugh, (laughs) for the land is full of bloody crimes, and the city is full of violence. I will bring the worst of the nations to take possession of their houses. I will put an end to the pride of the strong, and their holy places shall be profaned. When anguish comes, they will seek peace, but there shall be none. Disaster comes upon disaster. Rumor follows rumor. They seek a vision from the prophet, while the law perishes from the priest, and counsel from the elders. The king mourns, the prince is wrapped in despair, and and, uh, the hands of the people of the land are paralyzed by terror. According to their way, I will do to them, and according to their judgments, I will judge them, and they shall know, here it is, they shall know that I am the Lord. Oh boy, this doesn't really need much explanation, does it? Judgment, judgment, woe, woe, the time has come. Chapter 8, this is short. Come on, wake up. This is short. And it is really, really sad. God is going to show Ezekiel what's going on behind the scenes. He's going to actually give Ezekiel insight into the wickedness that's taking place in the temple. Let's have a look. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. Then I looked, and behold, a form that had the appearance of a man Below what appeared to be his waist was fire, and above his waist was something like the appearance of bright, the brightness of gle- like gleaming metal. He put out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head. Imagine that. Out comes a hand and you're picked up by your hair. Put, took me by a, a lock of my head and this... Hang on a minute. I thought he shaved off all his hair. It must have grown back. Um, And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem. So this is a vision. To the entrance of the gateway, to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court. I'm losing my place. Uh, The inner court that faces north. where where, Where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provokes to jealousy some kind of idol that they'd set up. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the valley. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes toward the north, and behold, north of the altar gate in the entrance was this image of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, Do you see what they're doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here to drive me from my sanctuary? But you will see still greater abominations. And he brought me into the entrance of the court. And when I looked, behold, there was a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, son of man, dig in the wall. So I dug in the wall. And behold, there was an entrance. And he said to me, go in and see the vile abominations that they're committing there. So I went in and saw, and there, engraved on the wall all around, was every form of creeping things and loathsome beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel. And before them stood seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel, with Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, standing among them. Each had his censer in his hand, and the smoke of the cloud of incense went up. See, they're in the middle of worshipping idols. 
Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark, each in the room of his pictures? For they say, the Lord does not see us, the Lord has forsaken the land. He said also to me, you will see still greater abominations that they commit. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? You will see still greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord. Yes. What is Tammuz? Tammuz was um, like a, a goddess, an I, you know, another idol. But they were weeping for Tammuz in the mythology. I think she, um, uh, she had been killed and they mourned for her in the kind of um, pagan mythology. Anyway, he brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord, and behold, at the entrance of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their packs to the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, worshipping the sun, toward the east. And he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations that they had commit here, that they should fill the land with violence and provoke me still further to anger? Behold, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore I will act in wrath. My eye will not spare nor will I have pity. Though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Lord, we are terrified at the reality of your wrath. And we see it, Lord. We see your heart broken over the sins of your people but also resolute to judge them. And we know that your heart is broken over the sins of this world and also resolute to bring that sin to an end and to bring your judgment upon the earth. Have mercy, Lord. In your wrath, remember mercy. Save some. Please, would you still have mercy and save some before it's too late. Lord, help us to deal with these realities wisely. Help us not to get carried away or unbalanced. And thank you that you were very specific in appointing Ezekiel to this mission. And though we do have a ministry of warning, we still have good news. We praise you for that, that we can announce the good news, that our commission is to... Go with this joyful message of sins forgiven to the ends of the earth. But we know that your judgment is still coming. That even as Paul warned people, to f- and Peter warned the Jews to flee from the wrath to come, Lord, we, we pray that you would give us faithfulness both to warn and to preach the good news. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, God bless you. Don't get unbalanced and stand on the street corner crying woe, woe, or shaving your head, or running around with a sword, whacking portions of your hair. No chance of that, is there? Come on, sleepyhead. Time for you to go to bed. Go and turn the camera off. You can do it. And we will see you, God willing, tomorrow. So uh, for now, we'll say goodbye. God bless you.